And the first thing that we would like to do today is literally talk a little bit about the history of wilderness. It will take about an hour. It's part of the Vlad Ivan show, my colleague, Wilderness Training Center offers. Now I'm supposed to say hi to you, Vlado, because Vlado is in the high Tatras. He has decided to escape from the COVID uh, crisis and is sitting all by himself in a little remote cabin in the midst of the snow, uh, surrounded by bears and lynx, and has decided to stay up there till all of this is over, since he, just like me, is in the risk group. So I congratulate him that he was able to do that. We are stuck here, even though it's nice outside in, in Austria and the Lunga. So it takes about an hour. I hope you bear with me. And like I said, use the chat window to put all your questions forward. Let's start with the history of wilderness. Like I said, the audio settings, introduction to Zoom, mute and unmute, question and answer. You can like and comment on a question. We chat, you can raise the hand or you can leave the meeting at any point in time. It's a very simple software, basically. It goes without saying that some of you may have known us already, but for those who do not know us yet, we are a small organization based here in Austria in the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. And we are basically working all across Europe. But we are not just biologists. We come from diverse backgrounds. We have lawyers, we have marketing people, we have tourism experts, uh, we have even the scientists in our group, believe it or not. But we all share a common belief that wilderness is important. Without wilderness, we will lose a very important part of what is so important to our to our future, to our life. And our mission is literally to identify wilderness areas across Europe, uh, designate them, help local activists, local organizations, or even governments to try to put these under some form of protection, different from country to country. And then, and we are specifically are using the word steward not to manage, because manage means we will do something in the area. And you will see shortly that in wilderness, we do not manage wilderness. We are just stewards. We look after them and learn from them, observe what's happening. And obviously, we need to promote it, because if the public does not understand why we do what we do with wilderness, the funding, the support in the public and the appreciation of wilderness will drop. Now wilderness, typically in the European context, is always associated to forest. Forest equals wilderness, but that's not the case. So we also are looking after wild rivers, which are undammed, natural flowing rivers. Wild coasts, where we have the interaction between the coastal marine wilderness and uh, the coast itself, the land wild islands, of which there are many in our rivers, islands which never a human has put a foot on, wild forest, obviously, and wilderness is then used for, for, for those areas where there's a little bit of everything. And we do a lot in youth work. Now, I show you a quick video that summarizes, I hope it works, uh, what we are and, and, and how we do it.
Matches aus der Union in der Central Europe. Wir brauchen Wildnis in Europa, weil es der Gen für die Zukunft ist. Wildnis zeigt. That video obviously was a little bit uh, laggy because uh, we still have for the next presentation to downsize a little bit. But it gives you an idea what we a little bit do. So we look after these wilderness and we really would like to promote them as we go forward. Myself, I'm not a biologist. I come actually out of the business and management science area and was tasked in 2014 to manage the European Wilderness Society because there's one fundamental fact which we often ignore. Everything we do needs money and therefore business skills. I worked in many countries in the world which kind of helped me in this work because different cultures, different approaches uh, and communication is something I can really do. And I now live in this beautiful little biosphere reserve in Austria. Now, where did this whole wilderness movement begin? It basically began in the 15th century. Now, we all talk about deforestation today, but the first year of deforestation which happened, happened in the 15th century. Uh, we cut down almost all of the beach forests we had, because until then, the coal, the, uh, as we know it, was not discovered yet, or very minimal only. But the beginning of the industrialization, especially of the glass production and porcelain, needed charcoal. And for that charcoal, we cut down about 70% of the beach forests in Europe. And with that, we also created the first climate crisis because the little ice age is linked a little bit to that. And the ice age then triggered the witch hunts of which there is now many scientific papers out because obviously a lot of people turned to the, the churches and said, why is it becoming ice cold? Why is my crop dying? And the church had nothing better to do than instead of blaming ourselves on how we destroyed the nature onto it, they blamed the witches. And even here in Alungao, until 1614-48, we burned our last witch. And it coincided with the ice age becoming coming to an end. So climate kind of adapted. Well then, in the 18th to 19th century, this romanticism kind of came back. The forest had kind of because coal was discovered, the pressure on the forest had decreased, and a lot of um, research, uh, painters, artists discovered the wildness. And it was not just uh, Caspar David Friedrich, who, by the way, also was very instrumental in a uh, German uh, painter in, in, in many of the wilderness areas in Germany that we talk about and painted them. The Watzmann, the mountains, that's what he did. But it was also the time of the Grimm brothers, where we suddenly, the wolf has shown up. And, and they collected all of this information. And we had this longing again for this wildness in us. Well, that was in Europe. While at the same time, and I hope this video will now go a little bit better because it's coming from YouTube. 
something completely different happened in the United States. And for that, I will show you this YouTube link. And that was in the Pacific Northwest, the complete destruction of the old growth forests in the way that makes our today's Amazon logging seem like a child's game. And at that time, they didn't even have yet the mechanical tools. They just used these simple, simple axes, but they managed to totally deforest the Pacific Northwest. And that happened from 1850 all the way to the 1930s. And when you look at the size of those trees, they had trees which had a thickness of three to four meters. Trees that nobody today can even understand ever existed. And that kind of, at one point, provided a lot of jobs, but it also created a lot of, a, a, a lot of apprehension because we suddenly saw, I mean, look at the size of those trees. Incredible. On what we were able to do in these times and days. And that is destroy the habitats, especially in those days, the forest, in a very short time frame. And I will just continue this video because I think most of us have never really experienced now you see already they were using ropes, they were building these spar trees to transport. And, and look in the background a little bit. Complete destruction of the biggest forests that at that time existed in North America. And NGOs didn't exist. Sustainable forestry, as you can imagine, was a word. You see the background. The whole soil was ripped away. That, by the way, is called a so-called donkey engine. These workers were working for little money in an extremely dangerous uh, uh, workplace. Oh, it's Sultan joined. Hi, Sultan. They built these railways using simple tools. And at one point in time, every forest in the United States, in the Pacific Northwest, had these special lanky railways built in. Just, and, and, and you just see that was the forest before, and you can see how the forest looked afterwards. The trees were dumped into these rivers, millions and billions of trees. The rivers at that point in time were so acidly that there was nothing alive in the rivers anymore. And again, the size of those trees. And now you can imagine that those days we didn't have yet the fiber board. These wooden boards, they were two meters in diameter simply because the trees were still that big. Okay, so that happened in the US, the intensive logging in the Pacific Northwest. And that coincided with the first national park being created in the United States which was Yellowstone. And one of the big motivating factor was to prevent in Yellowstone from happening what was already happening in the Pacific Northwest. Now let's remember the Pacific Northwest had close access to harbors. So most of the wood was shipped around the world. 
Yellowstone was inland, and that they were all afraid that at point, one point in time that they would eventually get to Yellowstone. And in Europe, the Dauerwald idea, the Dauerwald strategy was also developed in those days because even here, the industrial logging started to progress. And it was Friedrich College, a private forest owner, who found that the Berentorener Kieferwirtschaft, which is translated as Berentower, a spruce economy. And that was then adapted by the Tarrant University in Dresden. And the basic idea was that for every tree you cut down, you should plant another one. So Dauerwald translators continuous forest coverage. So in 1884, we started to say, look, this just ripping the trees out and, and not replanting is not sustainable. And also as a counter reaction, the Sierra Club was created, was what was the first uh, NGO, and again, happening in the Pacific West as a reaction towards these dramatic logging operations. Well, oh, that was too fast. And in 1906, the US Forest Service was created. And that was kind of a, a, a big thing because even the Forest Service took from Germany, who at that time has exported the Dauerwald philosophy to around the world as their guiding principle. But with the US Forest Service, what was often forgotten, forgotten was the establishment of 150 national forests, bird reserves, game reserves, national parks, and these national monuments. So in fact, in 1906, the US started to protect the remnants of what was kind of wild areas or wilderness to not have these, these de-logging, this deforestation happening the way that was happening in the Pacific Northwest. And it took only eight years for it to jump to Europe. So in 1914, the Swiss National Park was the first national park in Europe and that kind of triggered the first reaction in Europe. But it took still some time until the 1930s when Aldo Leopold visited Europe. And kind of interesting, the university we worked together with, the H&E of Oswalda, was also one of the two universities he visited. And he said, look, I like this Dauerwald idea. The Germans are exporting this idea of sustainable forestry. I'm gonna go to Germany and I will really wanna know what are they doing? What's the underlying principles? Why are they doing it? And he saw the idea basically was not bad, having sustainable forestry. But he also recognized that if you went to Brandenburg, because that's where Dresden, Berlin, that's the area, that Germans had, typical Germans, used tractors and were plying to the trees like little Prussian soldiers, row after row after row after row. And he said, yeah, the Germans have got continuous forest cover, but that is not a forest anymore. And that triggered to him in the 1936, when he returned to the US, as saying, guys, I like this Dauerwald idea. If you're doing forest, uh, run it as a business, but it has nothing to do with wilderness. It's, it's not really sustainable in the long run. And when you think about it, 1936, Aldo Leopold already said, that the way that we manage our forests is not really sustainable. And you look at today, it's amazing how many years we lost. Obviously we know what happened. Three years later, the World War broke out. Um, obviously there was not much nature conservation happening in those terrible six years. But already 1948, the IUCN was set up. And that was part of this whole movement after the Second World War, that we are all in this together. It's not just Germany or United States. We should take a global approach, which Mr. Trump, I think at the moment, may understand or not understand that um, working all by yourself is not really doable. And part of the IUCN mission was to come up with categories of protected areas. So we had the United Nations, we had the United Nations, 
uh, human, we had the United Nations Environmental uh, Program, and IUCN, in, in the wake of all this, was suddenly tasked in 1948 to come up with a system of protected areas. It still took another 13 years, and then WWF was created. So when you think that the Sierra Club was created at the beginning of the 19th century, it took like almost 60 years before WWF entered the scene. And why was that important? Because the Sierra Club was very US focused and WWF already specified in the name was the World Wildlife Fund. So we had after the government in 1948 did a global government approach, it took until 1961 till the NGOs, or one NGO decided also to take this global approach. And shortly thereafter, the Sierra Club, which obviously had a lot of uh, years in front of it and had already done a lot of work, the big breakthrough happened on September 3rd, 1964, when the US Wilderness Act was passed. And with it, they protected 37,000 square kilometers of federal land. So in 1964, wilderness was officially a category of, of, of a protected area in the United States. Just like a national park, you had wilderness areas. IUCN never adopted that. For IUCN, yes, you had a category 1A, 1B, but they were typically incorporated, at least in Europe, into national parks. So in the national legislation, the IUCN 1A, 1B was never really formally adapted in the German or Austrian or French national legislation. So here, an IUCN 1A, 1B area is always embedded into a national park or something other form of protected area. But the United States already had that in 1964. Three years later, the Treaty of Rome was, and Merger was started. Now, let's remember, the European Union at that time didn't exist yet. But the Treaty of Rome basically unified the economic or in integrated the economic systems of the European Union. And that was the European communities, not mistaken with commission, communities, but that was in 1967. And it took till 1992, till the same Treaty of Rome, based on the Treaty of Rome, the so-called FFH directive was passed. Now, what does FFH stand for? It is the Flora and Fauna Habitat Directive of the European Union. It came out of the bird life momentum that you know birds need a special form of protection but everybody realized it's not just enough to protect the birds where we always had the Vogelschutzke beta we always had some form of protection for migratory birds the habitats that these birds live in should also be protected and that was six months before the European Union was founded so before the European Union was created the FFH director which governs everything that is nature conservation in Europe was already passed by the Council of the European Communities. And with that, the so-called Natura 2000 network was created. Now we will get to that, that there's a little bit of a challenge between Natura 2000 wilderness, but in fact, it took until 1992 for Europe to finally have a European approach, just like the US Wilderness Act, which was unified from the wilderness, to the whole issue of nature conservation. July 1st, the European Union was created. And then came a big step forward in 1997 when Pan Parks by WWF Netherlands, and we have in our audience today, Sultan, Sultan, when you later on we go into QA, I will, uh, you can introduce, I will introduce you to the team. Sultan was, was right there from the very beginning. And, but Pan Park had a focus at that time, sustainable tourism, that was a big thing. And wilderness was, or at least sustainable tourism protected areas, because Pan stood for protected air network, was one of those key things that, that, that they were looking at. But the good news was that with the support of WWF Netherlands, 
and the Pan Park, a whole big system of criteria, principles, and everything else was created, gigantic documents and guidelines on what, world, what, a, what a protected area principles should meet, what criteria it should meet. And they were very, very wilderness oriented. And in 2002, Ulanka was Europe's first audited and designated wilderness. Now, what do you see that I'm using the word audited? Because in the US, the Wilderness Act just designated wilderness. Nobody really audited them. There were areas which people thought were wilderness, but there was never really a formal auditing process. Europe went a different way. They said, before we designate a wilderness, we first should audit it. And there's a view of Alanka taking during the Pan Park years um, in Finland. And then in 2009, I mean, that continued for seven years, Ulanka, Panetta, Retazat, many more areas joined the Pan Park network. And Sultan managed then, together with Vlado in 2009, to trigger the European Union into beginning the European Parliament into uh, basically asking the European Commission to put forward uh, and, and task uh, uh, and focus on wilderness. And what was in that European Union wilderness resolution? The European Parliament called on the European Union Commission to develop a clear definition of what wilderness is, to map the areas, undertake a study, develop a strategy, develop wilderness areas and carefully manage rewilding. So in 2009, the word rewilding showed up and promote. Now of all of those, very few things so far have really been implemented. We do have a clear definition. There is a map, but it's based on GIS data, not a lot of field work out there. The studies on the values and benefits of wilderness, yeah, some exist, but it's not really comprehensive. A European wilderness strategy uh, doesn't really exist. It's all federal, it's all independent of how each country approaches wilderness. Develop wilderness areas and carefully manage rewilding areas, yeah, again, falls back to that each country has a different approach to this. And promote, yeah, there has been some work done. So in 2009, the Wilderness Resolution was passed. The prior conference on May 29 uh, also started, and that triggered then a three-year process involving 230 experts, advocates, representatives of governments and wilderness areas to work on this European definition and the principles. And that was done under the umbrella of the Wild Europe Initiative, which uh, was run by Toby Acord. And by 2013, October 9, this wilderness working group passed the wilderness definition. Out of a draft became a this is it. Now coinciding, and when you look at that date, you will recognize that that date is very, was right during the Salamanca at the Wild 10 conference. But simultaneously with once that wilderness definition was passed, WW Neverland said, okay, Pan Park mission completed. So the Pan Park project was ended, okay? But the Pan Park, having ended, triggered then the beginning of the European Wilderness Society. And when we now look at what was all developed in those years, less than 20 years ago, we had the conference, we had the working definition, we had the World Wild 10 in Spain, guidelines came out, a German definition of wilderness was passed, a register was developed, and, 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 and. And that then led to this definition. So in Europe, and I'm only talking about Europe, wild areas, wilderness areas, are governed by open-ended, undefined natural process. They are composed of native habitats and species and large enough for the effective ecological function of natural process. They are unmodified or only slightly modified and without intrusive or extractive human activity, settlements, infrastructure, or visual disturbance. So, 
It basically is an area where we don't do anything. We are not allowed, but I get to that, we are not allowed to do anything. And the processes that are happening in there are happening the way that nature, even though maybe human influence, lets them happen. And that's gonna be very important as we move forward. Now, besides wilderness, we must realize there's also wild areas, which are not quite wilderness yet. And they have only a high level of these natural processes, the natural habitat. So there, they're a little bit smaller, they're more fragmented. And, and here again, it, they, they are like wilderness, but not quite there yet. And what does this in effect mean? A wilderness has no hunting, no logging, no mineral collections, no mining, no deadwood collection, but also no disease or alien species control. So if we have an invasive alien species in the wilderness, we are allowed to do nothing. We just observe how a natural dynamic habitat handles these invasive species. So contrary to Corona, where we are now learning what to do, and in fact, we are just learning how to deal with this virus. We're using techniques and strategies, but we, we can't fight it. There's nothing we can do it. So either we learn how to cope with it or we succumb to it. And I'm sorry if I make that parallel, but to some degree, that's almost identical to wilderness. So if there is an invasive species in that area, nature e either learns how to deal with it, or if it doesn't, it basically will get destroyed. But as we know from history, look at the Chernobyl, look at Mount St. Helen, nature will come back afterwards. So nothing is ever permanent. And also important is no restoration. We are not allowed to do any restoration. Now, Mark Fisher, who is always also a long, long advocate for wilderness, had a much shorter definition of what these open-ended, undefined natural dynamic processes are. They are self-willed land. So the nature does what it wants to do and not what we think it should do, what we think or believe could be doing. And uh, Robert Leslie, who uh, a colleague of mine had the pleasure of uh, skiing last winter together because he's based in Gunnison, um, developed this wilderness continuum, which was adapted to this whole issue about wilderness. And we can nicely see that wilderness is at the high end where there is very little to no human modification. Europe has human modification. And even the wilderness areas in the Pacific Northwest, after we've seen how these gigantic trees were cut out, okay, leads us to know that there are very few areas that are not being modified. So 2014, the European Wilderness Society was created. Their Pan Park Network was then expanded to the uh, European Wilderness Network. The audit process was formalized. And today we have now an audit process which will be handled in a separate, separate webinar consisting of 10 principles, 57 criteria, 130 indicators. There's more than 40 areas in Europe which meet that criteria. And always remember we have to promote it. We also put a lot of additional information around it and promote it and train people on how to steward and look after these wilderness. And one of those little things that we do is this. This is one of the largest wilderness areas in the Ukraine. no sign of logging in that forest.
we went really into the forest, which was uh, very, very beautiful. What I think about being there and getting you in the forest, I felt really at home in my wild home. And I also liked the diversity of the group, which also. Um, mirrors diversity of nature the way i experienced nature was so awesome so different um, so much more away from society it was a great experience and i found a forest that it should be wild adventure, European Wilderness Society. That was one too many. So yeah, call for donation. Please support us, do our work. Um, for me to summarize, basically, we would not be where we are in this wilderness protection if in the United States, this deforestation, this absolute destruction of these habitats would have happened. So sometimes it takes something bad to then develop something good. The amazing thing for us is that even though we saw that destruction of deforestation by the logging industry, which was like 160, 70 years ago, it has continued until now. So we humans somehow seem to be incapable of learning from each other. And because we are so incapable, it needs people like you who are listening in, 48 people and people on Facebook Live, to have an open mind to, to, to look in the past, see what we can learn from that, and then apply that to today.